for today is our first in the next and last subsection here in class under the, the running biomechanics topic, and that's the relationship between uh, running shoes and uh, running economy and running performance. Um, this is a very uh, contemporarily popular topic in uh, biomechanics. I would say it's one of the most uh, popular topics. Um, to avoid giving you the impression that it's, it's only a recent thing, we're going to uh, look at a, a fairly old paper here from uh, 1986, a, a paper that uh, examined the relationship between the uh, construction of the midsole of a running shoe and uh, the economy of running in that shoe. Um, before we get into the guts of the paper here, let's do a, a quick summary of the history of the modern running shoe. And this will be kind of biased towards Nike just because they're the, the company that I'm, I'm most familiar with in terms of their products and they were kind of the, uh, the, the, the founders of the modern running shoe, the first ones to make what's, what's recognized as the, uh, the typical modern running shoe. There's of course other companies that, uh, that, that are relevant in, in that space and have, have, have had innovations in that space. But Nike is the one that, that most of us are, are most familiar with just due to their, uh, their visibility and their, their size as a company and their, their kind of pop culture presence. Um, the very first shoe that Nike ever made, which is typically considered the first modern running shoe, is this shoe here. It's the Nike Cortez, which was released in 1968. Um, this is a scene from one of my favorite movies, Forrest Gump, where Tom Hanks' character here, Forrest Gump, is going to run um, across the United States. And he gets, uh, at the time, some new running shoes from this new company, Nike, to do this. Um, the unique thing about these shoes, and these were shoes that were intended uh, for jogging, for, for fairly slow running over fairly long distances, um, the unique thing about these shoes at the time is you can see here they have a fairly thick part of the shoe that's known as the midsole. Okay? Um, this wasn't the first shoe to have a midsole. Lots of shoes had had some sort of uh, material here um, under the upper part of the shoe, which is this, this uh, uh, material up here typically made of some sort of fabric, um, but a shoe with a midsole that was this thick here, with this much material um, underneath the heel in particular, uh, was a new thing at the time. Most, most shoes for running uh, prior to this and, and at around this uh, from other vendors didn't have that uh, much midsole material. Um, the intention here was to give you some cushioning there underneath the heel, assuming your heel striking, and to make uh, running uh, for long distances and long periods of time a little bit more comfortable. Um, if you Google uh, first Nike shoe and look at images, um, you won't typically see a picture of this, even though this was, at least as far as I know, the first uh, Nike shoe that they made for running. Um, you'll typically see something like this. And this was a little bit later on. This shoe was released in the uh, early 1970s, and this was their first shoe uh, for running races, for trying to run um, a long distance at a, at a fast speed, as fast as you possibly can. And you can see this shoe here has uh, just a lot less material to it than the Cortez shoe on the, on the uh, previous slide here. This shoe was called the Nike Moon shoe, and this was, again, their first shoe uh, that they made for racing. And you can see it's a much, much lighter shoe, much less material um, under the midsole and just in general constructing this shoe here. So def definitely a much, uh, much lighter shoe than, than the Cortez, which was a fairly, uh, fairly large, fairly bulky shoe for a running shoe. Um, one innovation that Nike made in, uh, in R&D and in shoe engineering um, a little bit later on, this was in, in, the, uh, in the late 1970s, was the Nike Air technology, which is one of the big key uh, technology pieces associated uh, with Nike as a company. Um, you've probably heard of Nike Air before, but you may not actually know uh, what Nike Air is. So what is it exactly? Um, it is literally air. Um, it is pockets of air. Um, the material that the air is inside of here is typically uh, some sort of polyurethane foam, um, then inflated with air to a, a certain pressure level and inserted here within the uh, construction and the layers of material that make up the midsole of the shoe. Um, this is the first shoe that Nike made with Nike Air uh, technology that was for running, the Nike Tailwind, and this was released in 1978. Um, you couldn't actually see the air pocket in the shoe. It was, it was hidden uh, through the, the other material that surrounded the shoe here. Um, once Nike Air got popular, then, then Nike decided, oh, maybe we should you know, put little cutouts here in the shoe so people can see the, see the air pockets and people can know I'm wearing shoes with, uh, with Nike Air technology. Um, this one here is a basketball shoe. I don't know if it was their first shoe that had Nike Air, but it was certainly uh, one of the first. This is a basketball shoe uh, from the early 1980s, I think. Uh, drawback here is then so you can, can see the air pocket there and then sometimes your friends would be mean and come and like jam a pencil uh, into your air pocket and then and pop it and then your shoes are no good. But you could see the, see the air pocket there. 
Um, we then kind of got away, or at least Nike uh, after this and the later on in like the, the 90s, 2000s, 2010s, kind of got away from the Nike Air technology. At least that's that's my impression. I don't actually know that much about shoes or even about running shoes really, but just my my impression is that it's not really, a, the, the Nike Air technology is not really a central part of uh, Nike's running shoe offerings in modern times. It used to be a lot. You used to be able to see a lot of Nike shoes uh, with the Air technology for running, and it seems to be something they don't really have that much. In, in most of their more recent offerings in running shoes. Um, until very recently, if we look at the um, most technologically advanced shoe that Nike makes for, for, running, uh, for racing marathons, um, this is the Alpha Fly, which was the, uh, I remember from a few lectures ago, the shoe uh, that the runner Eliud Kipchoge used uh, to uh, run in the sub two hour marathon. And you can see here, this shoe has Nike Air in it. It's got a little air pocket here uh, not in the heel of the shoe this time, but a little bit uh, further on, towards the, more towards the, the middle of the shoe or towards the front of the shoe. It looks like it's probably under uh, what would be uh, the, typically where the metatarsal heads or the toe joints would be on this shoe. So it looks like we've kind of come full circle here. We started out uh, not having any air pockets in our shoes. Um, we then added some air pockets, and we then kind of got away from that for a while, and now we're back to having air pockets again. So we would think that there's probably some benefit to this for performance, right? It's not just uh, for show because you couldn't even see them in the first shoe that used it. Um, is it just for marketing? Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe Nike realized, ah, oh, people like this. It doesn't actually do anything, but we can stick it on there and they can see it and people will buy it. So yeah, you know, maybe, maybe that's what it's for. Maybe it's just because people would buy it if it had an air pocket in it, that, that's possible. Um, you would like to think though, that it's not just marketing and not just talk, that there is some uh, practical benefit here, some benefit to the uh, economy or to the performance of running in a shoe with these air pockets that, 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 that is measurable and, and consistent and beneficial uh, for running. So what is that benefit and why is there a benefit, um, if there is one, to having air pockets in the midsole of your shoe here? Why is that a good thing? Um, that was really what this paper here for today was getting at. Um, this paper is by Frederick et al, 1986, uh, titled Lower Oxygen Demands of Running in Soft-Soled Shoes. Um, this is a great example of the kind of titles that I love in scientific papers because it tells you the key result um, of the paper right here in the title. So you kind of know what you're getting into right off the bat with the title. Um, they didn't mention in the title that the soft-soled shoe here was a shoe with uh, Nike Air uh, type technology, and that's, that's uh, what they were comparing here. Um, the first author here, uh, Ned Frederick, is a, a very prominent researcher in uh, running biomechanics and in running footwear biomechanics specifically. And here in the study, they were comparing uh, running economy in uh, 10 well-trained uh, male distance runners uh, between two shoes. They refer to them as a shoe A and shoe B. Um, shoe A, they say, was your uh, conventional uh, running shoe. It was just a, a typical modern running shoe uh, with a midsole made out of EVA, which is uh, ethylene vinyl acetate, a uh, pretty popular common material to make running shoes um, out of for, for shoes that are in kind of the mid-range of, 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 of price range of running shoes for most companies. Um, shoe B here was, they say, uh, conceptually similar in, in, in construction and some elements to shoe A, but incorporated a, a different midsole construction. In particular, the midsole of shoe B had uh, a polyurethane foam pocket that was inflated up to about one centimeter thick uh, with air. So they had a, a, a capsule here of air um, inserted into the midsole of shoe B, like you see here um, in the diagram there for the, for the Nike Tailwind. Um, I don't know what shoe, shoe B here actually was. They don't really describe it that much further and there's no pictures of it um, here in the paper. Um, I suspect that it was probably a version or maybe a prototype of a, a Nike Air technology running shoe, but I'm, I'm speculating there, I'm not, not certain of that. Um, long story short, they indeed found that running in shoe B, the shoe with the air pocket, was more economical than running in shoe A. So when you ran in shoe B, the amount of oxygen it took you to run at a certain speed was less than when you ran in shoe A. So you were a more economical runner running with the shoe with the air pocket than with the shoe uh, without the air pocket. I think the, the uh, average change was somewhere in the, the ballpark of a 2 to 3% uh, improvement in uh, running economy, which is a pretty substantial, uh, meaningful improvement in running economy. Now, the more interesting question here is why did shoe B uh, offer a more economical um, uh, energy cost of running than shoe A. 
And so rather than make this a really long video, because it's a really complicated topic, um, I'm going to leave you there with that question to ponder, and we'll get back into it uh, next time in a, a more modern paper that, that kind of here looked at, looked at some, some similar questions and the notion of why does having a certain midsole construction or certain cushioning levels in the shoe uh, have an energetic benefit, or can, why can that benefit a running economy? Um, one thing that you might kind of intuitively think is, is, a, is a benefit here is maybe it's just the weight of the shoe, right? Imagine uh, taping bowling balls to your shoes. It'd be very difficult to run, right? It's very difficult to swing a bowling ball through the air in the swing phase every time you take a step. Um, shoes don't weigh anywhere near bowling balls, but just from kind of that thought exercise, you can conceive that it makes sense that a, a lighter shoe would cost you less energy to swing the shoe forward in the swing phase, and, and, and so this could have an energetic benefit. Um, air is practically no weight at all. So presumably having a pocket of air there in the shoe, maybe it's just lighter. Maybe there's just not as much material there to that shoe. So maybe shoe B was just lighter than shoe A by, the, by merit of being constructed of literal air. So maybe it's just a weight thing. Um, that's a plausible argument, but it is not a feasible argument in this particular case. In fact, you can see here um, at the bottom of one of their methods paragraphs where they say the weight of shoe B was on average actually 31 grams per pair uh, heavier than shoe A. Now, how much is 31 grams? Is that a meaningful amount of mass? Um, 31 grams works out to um, a little bit over one ounce. And so if you split that up between both shoes, that's about uh, uh, 0.5 ounces or half an ounce per shoe. And is that a meaningful amount of shoe, ass, or <laughs> shoe mass? Sorry. Um, shoe, is that a meaningful amount of shoe mass? Um, shoe B, again, was about half an ounce heavier than shoe A, if you're looking just at a single shoe B versus a single shoe A. Um, typical running shoes will weigh in the ballpark of like 10 ounces, and it varies a lot. Like some shoes might be like five ounces, some shoes might be like 15 ounces, but ballpark a running shoe weighs about uh, 10 ounces. And so is uh, 0.5 ounces a meaningful amount of mass? Yeah, that's that's you know 5% of the mass of the running shoe. So shoe B here was, by my estimate, about 5% uh, heavier than, than shoe A. So the argument that maybe shoe B is more economical because it weighed less uh, certainly is not feasible in this case. It was actually um, a little bit heavier than shoe A. So something more complicated here must be going on than, than the mass of the shoe making it a more economical shoe. There's no reason to think that a heavier shoe would, would necessarily improve running economy. Now, what was different between the shoes was the uh, cushioning characteristics of them. And they talk about that um, a little bit here when they compare the results of some impact tests they did on the shoe. Um, notice here, they say in particular that shoe B had 7% more energy return from each impact and was penetrated or deformed by about two millimeters more per impact compared to shoe A. So in other words, shoe B was softer than shoe A. It deformed more when you applied a certain force to it, and it returned more energy. You deform it and store some strain energy inside it by deforming it, and then you get a larger fraction of that energy back when you unload it and convert that strain energy to kinetic energy. Okay? At least that's my take on, on, on what they're saying here, by it returning more energy and by it uh, deforming a little bit more. So think about that for next time. Why would it potentially be energetically beneficial for a running shoe to return more energy and to be a little bit less uh, stiff, a little bit more compliant than, than, than a less economical shoe? And I will leave you with that for today.